Welcome to the NMP Symposium. Uh, we have re-recorded this session due to some audio issues on the initial recording. Uh, so if you watched it live, it'll be a little bit different and hopefully a little easier to understand. Um, otherwise, enjoy. We will have the original Q&A session at the end. So when there is a new facilitator and everyone changes clothes, don't be alarmed. That is what happened. <laughs> um, so I believe that takes care of the intro. Uh, Rick and Rebecca, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Liana. And we are very happy to re-record in addition to have once done it all of our, all of our own. And um, one of the things that I'd like to just bring up is that when most of us we were taught about the generals, we were taught about the battles, and most people did not learn about the Civil War in the context of money. And our focus has been in the last several years on understanding much more about money matters of the Civil War, how the Civil War changed our money, and how money changed the war. And we found that Abraham Lincoln was at the center of a number of these changes and probably hasn't been given quite the amount of due that he is entitled to. Um, he was a major influencer in each of these areas by selecting the right people, by creating his own leadership teams, and by introducing um, opportunities for people around the country, including through the home, um, through the homesteads and the women um, who were back at their, in the cities and towns across the country. I'd like to take this back to just give you a, um, an opinion, a, 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 an overview of the fact that 1861 is actually now just 160 years ago. And we are starting to see there are 160th anniversaries of the Civil War. And it was in March of 1861 that Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as the 16th president. And this was not without a tremendous amount of turmoil. December of 1860, the first Southern state, South Carolina, seceded. And as that proceeded, um, a, the total of 11 Southern states seceded. By the time Abraham Lincoln actually was inaugurated, there were seven states that had seceded. And they didn't just say goodbye. They took with them all of the assets that were United States or federal assets that were within their boundaries at the time that they said goodbye. Many of the people in the North seemed to think that this, the, um, this would not be a costly event, that the Union would be able to prevail very quickly, will uh, create an army, but this is not going to be a big deal. And for the Battle of Bull Run, which was not far outside of Washington, D.C., it was assumed that this would be a rout by the Union, but the Union lost. We show here an image of a token that um, was commemorating Bull Run, and it was a shock to people that indeed the Union, this was not going to be a short war. And it was October 1st of 1861 that Abraham Lincoln stood on the, the steps of the treasury and, the, and created an appeal to the loyal women of America, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Rick and I have been, and, and my partner Rick Langer, he'll pick up the slack here in a moment or two, but <laughs> Um, we've looked at the 10 tumultuous years, kind of framing the Lincoln years with a start in coinage issues in 1857, where the United States outlaws foreign coins as legal tender. This starts to create a shortage in itself because most of the people, many of the people in the United States had not yet adapted themselves to using U.S. coinage, and they were still using the coinage that they were comfortable with, that they may have come with as they immigrated to the United States. The, um, uh, the SS Central America, a ship that is bringing from California millions in gold, sinks on the eastern shore. So some of this um, legal tender that was to be available to circulate is now gone. Abe Lincoln, again, elected as the 16th president, states begin to secede. When they go out, they're not just taking custom, they're taking custom houses, they're taking branch mints. And um, Rick will go further on into some of the acts that were, were um, enacted to, uh, to deal with coins and currency a little bit further on. But again, as the st Southern states are seceding, they're taking the mints. The, the Southern states, the, oh, the, pardon me, the US Treasury in 1859, for that particular year, had a total of 
81 million dollars in income and 70 percent of that or almost 70 percent of that income came from the use of custom houses so when the custom houses disappeared there was a tremendous blow to the income that was available to the north and the infrastructure also included marine hospitals which were there to care for merchant marines and most significantly, the branch mints, which had the bullion and the, the silver and the gold that was being used to mint coins for the United States. But during this period in time, throughout the Civil War, there were a lot of different kinds of coins, a lot of different kinds of paper money that was circulating. And we're going to give you a little overview on a lot of the different things that, uh, that might have been in somebody's purse, might have been in their wallet and which added a tremendous degree of difficulty to commerce. So by the time you get to Lincoln's inauguration, there is literally no small change. The mints are, are, um, are secured by the, the Southern mints are now seized by the, sub, the, the Confederacy. Hoarding is rampant because the coinage at that time actually had bullion in it. It was really silver coins or gold coins or copper coins. And it added to the literal lack of small change circulated. So Rick Link, take it over from here and I'll come back in a few minutes. All righty. Uh, first of all, it's really important to remember that when the war broke out, let's say in 1859, uh, when, when things were really heating up, um, the United States government only produced coins. It was not producing paper money. Paper money came about because of the extreme pressure, the need to have more circulating cash. We'll get into that in a little tiny bit. But the bottom of the bottom line is five mints were in operation in 1859 and 1860. They were <clears throat> San Francisco and Philadelphia, but in the South, it was Dahlonega, Georgia, Charlotte, North Carolina, and a truly huge mint in New Orleans. And, you know, in 1861, April, the three out of the five mints were in Southern hands. They were no longer producing money for the North. And that did, of course, create a huge shortage. New Orleans produced every bit as much money as the Philadelphia mint. They did not produce any pennies when Philly did. But um, it was a huge blow have all those federal assets sequestered or taken in trust by the South. Now, <clears throat> not related to that blow per se, but the North did have a way to compensate for this loss. They couldn't do it directly during the war, but it's important to note that Abe Lincoln did authorize, the Congress authorized, he approved three new branch mints. 1862 was Denver, 1863 Carson City, and 1864, a little known spot called the Dalles, Oregon. So we'll start in the south. <clears throat> Basically, you had the mint in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which produced gold coins only. Dahlonega, Georgia, which produced gold coins only. When those two were taken by the south, they never reopened again. They were truly casualties of war. They were really and truly collateral damage in the war. And in the South, the New Orleans Mint was also taken over, um, but it continued to produce quite a bit of coinage, mostly half dollars for both the state of Louisiana and then the Confederacy. Several hundred thousand federal dies using federal bullion. So the coins basically looked exactly like northern coins. Um, <clears throat> there are some little tiny issues, little fissures in the, the mint. People can make some distinctions between the coins, but when that mint closed down, it never produced another coin until 1879 when it reopened. Go ahead. Now here's a great little uh, panorama of southern coins and mint marks. On the far left, you can see the big O, that's the New Orleans Mint Mark, half dollar, 61. That's the one that they continue to produce in the South um, using the Northern dyes. In the center with the C, that's the Charlotte, so, uh, gold dollar. 
and a $3 gold coin that came out of Dahlonega. And there's a clear D on the $2.5 gold coin. Okay, um, this whole uh, new opening of opportunity for money coming out of the West was a huge boon to the North. Uh, the state of California and the state of Oregon were in the northern camp, if you would, and the territory of Nevada also eventually became a northern state, and that's where the money was. Um, Colorado was where the Comstock load took place. Huge, huge amounts of silver. Nevada and Oregon. So we have that. So we'll start with the three mints that Abe Lincoln approved. 1862, as we mentioned, Denver, Colorado. Everyone has a coin around Denver. Still going strong. But what people don't really realize is it was an assay office only for a long time. And uh, it didn't coin until, I think, 1907. So it was approved in 1862. It was operating during the Civil War, but as an assay office. It basically, I believe, bought a building that was in operation in Denver and it rapidly became converted to an assay office. The Carson City Mint had to be built, and it was built again because of silver. And, uh, even though it was authorized to strike gold coins, it never did. And that famous Carson City Mint Mark everyone covets in the coin collecting world, that came about because of the Civil War, though it didn't produce a coin until about 1870. Now, the least known of all these mints that Abraham Lincoln approved was in the Dallas, Oregon, which is the from Portland, Oregon, along the Columbia River and on the Oregon Trail. Let's talk a little bit about this place. We get into it in a lot more detail in our books, but this is an amazing place. It's a gorgeous location. This is the Dalles. It's along the Columbia River, and that's Mount Hood, uh, <clears throat> rising 11,000 feet uh, in the distance. Spectacular place. But in 1865, in that area, that period of time, it was a real wild west town. There was a gold strike that took place in Eastern Oregon that is not nearly as well known as the California gold rush. And uh, the gold strike took place in 1861, which was very fortuitous for the Union because that gold all went to the, the, the Northern cause. Okay, back. Now we're going to jump ahead and tell a little bit more of a, a tragic story about the Dalles. Um, and it ties into a very famous recovered uh, hoard of coins out of San Francisco. In 1865, I believe, uh, it's one of the last things that Lincoln was able to do. He approved the gentleman named William Logan to be the first director of the U.S. Branch Mint in the Dallas, Oregon. And uh, he was very well liked. I want to comment that the Dallas had been a trading post and a hunting ground for American Indians for 10,000 years. And uh, the Indian and uh, let's see, pioneering population got along well there. There was an army base there to look out for the interest of all parties. Logan was in charge of Indian affairs, as I mentioned, and uh, he would have made a tremendous mint director. Um, there was no hostility. The Indians were not being moved away from the uh, gold as they had been in the long of Georgia. So, that being said, William Logan and his wife were on a paddle boat returning from some medical attention in San Francisco. On board this boat, called the Brother Jonathan, um, was uh, a very large payroll of gold coins that came out of San Francisco, the Granite Lady. And this slabbed coin that you see right here, as you can clearly see at the top, dated 1855, $20 bill, I mean $20 gold piece, uh, was aboard the Brother Jonathan, and it was an MS-65 coin, beautiful coin. On the right, you see uh, a little artistic rendering of how uh, the trail of the coins and a travel coaster uh, that, that features the Brother Jonathan. And 
this is off of a note, a bank note, a, a beautiful depiction of a paddle boat, which was just way the brother Jonathan appeared. Anyway, it sank tragically on its way back to Portland, uh, very close to shore, but almost everybody, including William Logan and his wife, died, and the entire payroll went to the bottom of the sea in a place that was very difficult to get to, it was not deep, but very tough in terms of the uh, tidal patterns there. The money was recovered in the 1990s, and as you can clearly see, these beautiful double eagles uh, are being sold to this day. Uh, and it all ties back to the mint at the Dalles. And uh, going on to describe it, what Brother Jonathan name comes from way back. Okay, so now just to tell you a little bit about Brother Jonathan, and it does tie into the whole story here of where the money came from. The gentleman that you see with the big bicep is Brother Jonathan, and he is the precursor to uh, Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam really came to be the representation of America after the Civil War. But during the Civil War, the Jonathan was a tough, strong, scrappy, how do I put it, rambunctious guy. And the United States uh, Treasury was able to wrangle a $50 million loan, unheard of in terms of the amount of money that they borrowed, I believe, in 18 early. Anyway, the bottom line is John Bull on the left represents Britain, who had turned America down for a big loan. And uh, when the U.S. banks stepped up to the plate, everybody was happy. And uh, Brother Jonathan was happy to tell the world that he was really going to go fight this war right there. Okay, now, we only have two minutes left in the North. We have a lot of pressure for money. As a matter of fact, uh, the war by 1862 was costing $2 million a day for a land war and the Navy. Uh, the Mints could not produce that kind of money. As a matter of fact, there was a uh, famous uh, Supreme Court judge named Strong in Pennsylvania who said right after the war that if it not, had not been for paper money, which we'll get into, um, the U.S. couldn't have made it. Why? Because if you took of all the money, all the spare change in everybody's piggy bank across America, every bank, every business, funneled it into the treasury, it might have lasted three months, period, no more. So go ahead. First thing that America, the U.S. did, is we produced a paper dollar uh, unit. Uh, it's called the demand note. You could walk into a bank and demand gold in the face value, in this case, $100. And you can see the clear C up at the top. The C, of course, now became the symbol of well, That's pretty obvious. But now in slang, when someone says, I have a C note, this is where it comes from, $100. Uh, Civil War here. And Becky, tell me again what, uh, the, what you call it, a convertible bond, basically, oh, it, right? It just says it's convertible into 20-year, 6% U.S. bonds. Okay. A little uh, ticket or a little stub right. that you turned in to get your money. One last thing while we're on the subject of producing money. Um, individuals at the time, men, but as Becky will get into soon, a lot of women were hired to sign these notes on behalf of the Secretary of the Treasury and the Treasurer. These individuals didn't sit around, the, the, the real McCoy didn't sit around signing thousands of notes. So people were uh, allowed to sign for the treasurer of the United States, in this case, J.B. Stearns, who was a very famous artist at the time, very well known. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of stamps that were produced in the early 1900s featuring some of his work of uh, founding of America. J.B. Stearns sat in an office and just signed notes all day long in 1861. Right Again, uh, moving on to the Legal Tender Act, which happened in 1862, the father of the Legal Tender Act 
was a New Yorker by the name of Elbridge Spaulding, who had been the treasurer of the state of New York. Uh, he was in the U.S. House of Representatives. He introduced a bill to allow paper money to be legal tender without being backed by gold or silver. So currency. Anyway, he went and said, hesitancy and delay with the expenses of the war running on an average of $2 million per day would have been fatal. So the Congress and the U.S. did approve the Legal Tender Act. Uh, the American Banknote Company was hired to produce millions of dollars in paper money. And uh, basically, Spalding later in life said, it produced both an interest-free loan for the country and a national currency. And here's a political cartoon from 1864 when a guy named Thesston was the treasurer. He's shown here just cranking out the dollars. They're called greenbacks, and we'll get into that. But the bottom line is the authorization for legal tender meant that the treasury could just crank money. And it wasn't just without any any. Uh, means to protect against inflation. As a matter of fact, the U.S. did a great job of holding down and tamping down inflation, even though it's printing all this money for the first time. Um, we'll get into all that in some other period of time, but I do want you to know that the Treasurer, of the, tre the Secretary of the Treasury before Fessenden, uh, Sam and Chase, had threatened those bankers uh, when they were balking that $50 million note. He said, I'm going to keep cranking out this money on those presses until inflation is so bad that a breakfast will cost a thousand dollars. And with that, the bankers returned and they did secure that $50 million debt. Okay. So here's a beautiful example of the greenback. And it does have salmon chase clearly on the bill. There are two really important things to note here. Number one, at that time, during the Civil War, only up until 1866, it was perfectly legal and very acceptable to have the image of a living person on the note. Now, ever since 1866, and we'll get into this in just a minute, you can only have, I hate to say it, but dead presidents, but that's where that phrase came from in the movie a few years ago. You can only have folks that were dead and buried on American currency. However, when this money was first introduced, many members of the Treasury, including Fessenden and Chase, their picture was on the money. And that was to make the banking community feel comfortable by having a private, uh, a personal business card presented to you, the man that you respect. And that's the way they got this money to be accepted. Now, the green in the greenbacks came from the American Banknote Company, which had an exclusive right on what they called the green tint ink at the time. The whole story unto itself started in Canada. It was to prevent or curtail counterfeiting. So, go ahead, Becca. Here's some more examples of the money, printed money at that time. Of course, there was a lot of this paper fractional notes, 10 cents, 15 cents, 5 cents. This was to make up for the lack of small change, which Becky already addressed. There was none in 1861, 1862. It was hard to find a way to do commerce. It's also what led to the rise of Civil War tokens. We don't have enough time to get into all that today. But here's another back note. Made possible by the Legal Tender Act. You see the whole reverse of it is in green, which makes it very, very hard to counterfeit at the time. And there's a good splash of that green ink across the front of the note. Now, here's another very interesting story. This goes in, and addresses that issue of no living person's likeness can be on a bill after 1866. Abraham Lincoln himself did appear in life on a 50 cent note. And um, uh, it's signed by Francis Spinner, who was the treasurer at the time, and an incredible signature. Becky will get into that. But I think Abe Lincoln was the only, certainly the only president, maybe the only person at the time who appeared in life on a bill, and then after his death, posthumously on money up until this day on the $5 bill. Anyway, <clears throat> in this case, a loss was 
painful 15 cent note that was created to honor William Sherman and U.S. Grant as the heroes in the North. And uh, I was in 1866 after the war was won. My point here is they had already printed this note. It was all ready to go onto the street, but Congress passed a law forbidding any likeness of a living person to be on American currency for a variety of reasons, too detailed to get into right now. And these lovely notes honoring these two guys basically had to go in the trash bin. Obviously, they're still being collected and they're still circulating, but there's a law causing the Civil War because of the, the likenesses of living people that get on the bills for the first time in the 60s uh, that, that was outlawed to this day. It's one of the legacies of the Civil War, right? Now in the South, a whole other story, which we could spend all day on. This is just a little tiny representation of all the paper money that came out of the South. Everybody and their uncle could produce money. The Confederate government itself, every state in the South, many towns, railroads, you name it. My point is there was the, the Confederate government alone produced $1.7 billion in paper money, none of which was backed by gold or silver. You could say it was backed by cotton, and that kind of went south. No, 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 that by anybody. It was also backed by the collateral of, of slavery, so that also was eliminated by the war. So with that. Now here's where it gets interesting for the South. <clears throat> Living people, of course, could be a war zone on every note in the South, but the federal government, and in this case, Alabama, were the only areas that produced uh, paper currency that had living women on the bills. The North never had a living woman appear onto a note. And this was, of course, Lucy Pickens, who was the wife of the uh, governor of South Carolina. And uh, she was loved, also hated, because South Carolina is considered a Cold War started. And her husband that uh, authorized the shelling of uh, the Fort Sumter. Right. Now, this lady, very interesting, uh, lesser known soul, uh, Juliet Hopkins of Alabama. She was wealthy, but gave almost everything in her life, all of her assets to the South. And uh, for what it's worth, in doing the research, she was uh, the only person we know of, only woman who was. From the south, buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery when she passed at the age of 90. And one last point, these notes of Lucy, they had that green tint ink on the back to prevent some uh, counterfeiting. Um, they also had different verses. This one is called a circulating treasury note, fundable in stocks or bonds of the Confederate States. That's a little different than some of the other $100 or C notes that are just currency that basically say you can honor this note after we win the war or after the, the war is settled. So, but. now uh, one of the more, uh, shall we say, uh, colorful parts of the war uh, in terms of who produced the money, the North had the American Banknote Company, uh, the South had Evans and Cogswell, and several other companies too. But Evans and Cogswell was out of Charleston, South Carolina. And ironically, in 1864, when they were printing a lot of documents, a lot of money, for the Confederate, decided to move from Charleston into Columbia, South Carolina, where they thought it would be safer because the North was bombarding Charleston fairly regularly by 1864. They moved to build a large plant to start to print more money. And, uh, General Sherman comes to town, and uh, the Union Army had a particular dislike for Charleston because that's where the war was started, basically. That's the way the North looked at it. So <clears throat> Evans and Cogswell, their little building went up in smoke, and uh, they didn't rebuild for another couple of years. But it was ironic that they moved from Charleston to Columbia only to meet a very fiery end in 1865. Now, some more ways to fund a war. Uh, did you know that the Internal Revenue Service began because of the war? Um, 
Yeah, there were two acts. Revenue acts created the, the Bureau of Revenue, uh, and it was the first time that private personal income was uh, taxed. Everything up to that point was through these custom houses and tariffs collected at the ports. Right now, one more really important stop along the way, and a very important guy for everybody to know a little bit about, really changed the face of American banking, and uh, banknotes. Uh, the National Bank Act was passed in 1863, while Sam and Chase was still the Secretary of the Treasury. But at that same time, Abraham Lincoln hired a gentleman named Hugh McCulloch, who was a banker out of Indiana, originally from Maine. And Hugh ironically had come to town in 1862 or so to argue against the National Bank Act. He thought there were some issues that might be a little dangerous, like getting the U.S. government and the banking industry too tethered to each other. There were a few other issues, all of which he resolved. He did meet with Abe Lincoln personally. Abe hired him, Hugh McCulloch, to be the first comptroller of the currency in 1863. And in 1864, right, please. Oh, yes. This, is yeah. so this was from his message to Congress in 1862 that Lincoln is saying it is peculiarly the duty of the national government to secure to the people a sound circulating medium, furnishing to the people a currency as safe as their own government. And so he hired Hugh. Not only did he hire him as the comptroller of the currency, and he had some very strong words for the banking community when he took office and it's worth reading those notes someday. Anyway, the bottom line is, he's really the guy that instituted the National Bank Act. Sam and Chase had the vision for it. Abe Lincoln had the stomach for it and the gusto for it. But somebody had to actually sell the notion to the banks. And he was the perfect man, having been a successful banker, a state chartered bank in Indiana for years. So he knew that community. Right? Now, when Hugh took over, I love this, this print. It shows you just a tiny sample of all the kinds of currency that was circulating north and south. This is north, but you can see here, we have the chemical bank, we have the government bank, we have the cutting bank, and we have banks north, west, south, east, everyone's producing their own money. It was not unlike what was small change was like before the Coin Act in 1857, there was well over 8,000 individuals circulating at the time. And the parity of the value, you couldn't rely on it. Um, because they were state-oriented generally, a uh, $10 bill in Indiana might be worth $5 in Massachusetts. It might be worth $3 in Maine. And it was a really tough thing for Q to try to sell everybody on the idea of a national banking system. Go ahead. And here's some more notes for you guys that are collectors and people are just interested in engraving. Um, my grandfather had been an engraver for the American Bank Note Company. Therefore, I had a special interest in the beauty of these old notes. Um, you have the state of Alabama. You have the Hagerstown Bank, which was in our town. The Franklin Silk Company. The with a 20 cent note. I mean, you name it, somebody printed it and it wasn't all, shall we say, poor quality. As a matter of fact, counterfeiters were having such a good time because many of them had the experience to be good engravers or good lithographers. And the governments, especially the Southern government, couldn't afford the good inks and they couldn't afford the good paper. And sometimes the counterfeits were better than the genuine article. Here's another beautiful example, but this ties into the National Bank Act and it ties into the green tint. Here you have a 100 or C, $100 bill. A note, I'm sorry, it's a treasury, a treasury note. When, you, when your bank decided to become a part of the National Bank Act system, 
you had to buy a certain prescribed number of treasury notes. And that's another way that the North, through the human Republic, had to finance the war. So, you're a big bank, you're required to buy $100,000 worth of bonds. That money goes into the treasury, it funds the war. And this is a great, I'll make it very brief. We can study this later. But 1863 is when the bill went through, 1865 is when the war ended. Very short period of time. You can see assets and millions of national banks who are 16.8 million in the national banks in 1863, but well over a billion dollars in the national bank assets in just two years. And on the total flip-flop, the assets in the state banks went from 1.2 billion down to only 165.8 million in that same period of time. And uh, Hugh McCulloch was very proud of the fact that not a single bank failed that was part of his system. So here are a few of Hugh's views. We'll make these short, but I want to assure you that I'm going to be doing a lot more about Hugh McCulloch in a future book. Anyway, Hugh was very, very mindful, not jealous, but mindful of the fact that the guys that waged war, who fought the battles, were getting a lot more credit than the guys who financed the battles. So he actually said in his own memoir, it was a successful general who was the recipient of public honors, not to make things of war or supplies. Here's a nice portrait of Hugh. Uh, while he was still in office, uh, again appointed as the Secretary of Treasury of the Treasury in 1864 by Abe. And he was old school. He definitely believed that there is no real money except gold and silver. I don't find that much around here anymore. It is unfortunate that this fact was not appreciated when the Legal Tender Act was passed. We were passed through the Quebec. And here's one more view. It's kind of interesting because it's a whole heck of a lot less well known than the Legal Tender Act of 62 and the National Bank Act of 63. But in July of 1864, the US Congress passed the Anti Gold Futures Act. And that was an attempt, when people treat gold as a commodity to be traded, to rein in some of the uh, headlines or the parameters of that trade. And the, the, the attempt was to keep the ratio of the value of gold to legal tender paper money somewhat in line and to put a harness on inflationary pressures. Anyway, they rejected it just two or three weeks after they passed it. And it was Hughes' view that a government, any government, is absolutely impotent to give anything more than a limited and artificial value to banknotes that are not convertible into coin. Okay. One more thing for you collectors, especially, <clears throat> ever wonder about the nickel? Well, Hugh McCulloch is the man responsible for our first, what we'll call nickel, nickel. And I say that because from 1793 until 1865, we had no nickel. We had a half dime. And collectors will all probably have some from that period, very tiny. Um, easy to lose. And uh, during the war, a wealthy man named Joe Warden of Warden Business School fame, uh, he, um, he basically revived the nickel industry in America. He bought a failing mine in 1862 in Pennsylvania. He learned through his wealth, he hired the right people out of Europe to smelt and process nickel to make it really worthwhile. And it was Wharton who sold McCulloch on the first nickel, five cent piece. There it is. This one's dated 1869. First one was 1866. Hugh approved of the design, but I think it's worth noting to you guys that uh, Jim Wharton actually thought it was fairly ugly. He thought it reminded him of a funerary, you know, of a funeral uh, piece of some kind. Uh, he wasn't wild about the design, but he sure liked the fact that the U.S. Treasury was meant for buying his nickel. So, all right, one last big topic to cover, and this could be a whole day's talk by itself, counterfeiting. We've got minting, printing, counterfeiting. It is rampant. 
before. Um, there are many guys and gals in the business, the trade of counterfeiting, who are really good at it, better in some cases than the governments themselves. And by the end of the war, about 30% of all paper money and all paper bonds were fake. And they were very, very difficult to discern the difference in most cases. Um, there were plenty of fake coins. Uh, it's worth noting that the old Spanish reals uh, before the war were probably the most well circulated and, and most notably notoriously um, counterfeited coins in the world. There are people counterfeiting them in America and in Europe, anywhere overseas that someone wanted to spend a fake silver real. It was very prevalent. Anyway, uh, it's worth noting that one of the last, very last things that Lincoln did in his life was he appointed William Wood, who had been the head of the DC jail, tough guy, to become the first chief of the Secret Service at the U.S. Treasury. And it's worth telling you that the Secret Service was only in place to go after counterfeiters. It had nothing to do with protecting the President of the United States until 1900. And that's rather ironic for Abraham Lincoln, who surely could have uh, benefited from Secret Service protection. Okay, guys. Here's a tremendous image. It, it, it is from the Secret Service website. I'm telling you, don't know what the original source is, but you can see it right. Clutching a pistol is one of the tough early uh, service guys, enforcers, and he's going after these counterfeiters. Uh, they're shirting out coin on the old press, the old, uh, old screw press. And people on the back that are smelting the me uh, metals, people that are assaying the gold and silver. Anyway, this is the job. This is the job of the Secret Service right after the Civil War. All right, I'll turn it over to Becky. And now I would like to just offer up a couple stories about what women were doing during the war. Um, yes, they were prevalent. Yes, they actually started getting new jobs and they were actually invited to assist and to organize at the home front. Now, one of the most notable characters, and you may have seen his signature on some of the bills that Rick had shown a little earlier, was Francis Spinner. Francis Spinner became the treasurer of the United States in March of 1861, but he came from a banking background. And so, again, you've got another banker, you've got several bankers that are influencers in the um, new federal jobs. This new job, all of a sudden, we're printing money. The greenbacks are printed and they have to be signed, they have to be cut, they have to be clipped. And this is now a big deal. Um, the American Banknote Company out of New York is um, engaged and contracted to print all the currency, but something then has to happen after it's come back down to Washington, DC. So Spinner had been at the Mohawk Bank in New York as the president. And during that period in time, when the banks were again printing all their own money he had engaged his wife and daughters to help trim and to sign bank notes again i'm circling this because you'll never see i don't think a more intriguing signature as as um, you will for mr spinner but he realized that based on the experience he had, had with his wife and daughters indeed women were extremely agile and um, often it was claimed because they were good as sewers and users of scissors, that they would be wonderful assets to the Treasury Department to clip all these bills. Um, it, it served a couple purposes. Not only were the male clerks being recruited to start in, being enlisted in the army, um, but this enabled women to actually start getting jobs in the federal workforce. Not saying that there were not any women previously hired. There were several women who were with the patent office and a few other places, but not anywhere near the level of hiring that went on for uh, through the treasury. The subtotal of this is that Spinner noted early on that women did equal or better work and hey, they could actually be paid less. Um, he and President Lincoln were avowed supporters of trying to get Civil War women 
who were widows or the wives of disabled Union soldiers or who had otherwise been um, directly impacted by the war to, in, into these jobs. So thus is now a new career for women and it is nicknamed the Treasury Girls. This is more than just a couple women. This is now up to 400 women are hired. They're coming to DC from across the country, but mostly from around the Eastern seaboard as I understand it. And these are really the 1863's version of Rosie the Riveter. Now, Rosie got a lot of press, the treasury girls, we don't even know what all their names are. Um, so anybody who's got some, you know, great, great, great grandmother who was a treasury girl, love to know who that is. Um, the National Currency Bureau. Now you see as, a, as a, um, a, a sketch here of women, several of the uh, influencers of the time felt that it would be scandalous to have women work in the same room as men because that's going to start to uh, be a problem. And in there are a couple of scandals that really were uh, not true but they were, they were, as Rick said, politically motivated. Um, it was very unusual, again, for women, especially married women, to work outside their homes. It had been women who were uh, potentially extremely poor, who had worked in factories, maybe they were single, but a married woman was not typical to be found out in a workplace. So some of these women who, as Rick had mentioned, came to D.C., they were asked, as the clerks had been, to actually sign their own names for the treasurer. It had been originally planned that because of the potential for counterfeiting, that the treasurer himself be the one responsible for signing each individual treasury uh, piece of paper currency. But this was overwhelming at the volume that was needed to be able to keep the country running. So I'm going to sign for the treasurer. So, um, it is now a collector item to be looking for the names of the women who had signed, and in, in some cases, even before the treasury girls, who were the clerks whose names are signed on the bills. Um, genealogical researchers would be keen to know what some of these names are. And this was not unique to the North, either to the Union. Um, the Confederacy also had, as Rick had mentioned, they were printing billions of units and at the time, there was no ability to have that treasurer just be sitting in a room and signing and signing and signing. So there are lists of names of men and women who were working for the, Fed, the uh, Confederacy and signing their own names for the treasurer. Now, in October of 1861, which is just now 160 years ago from about three weeks ago, um, Lincoln at the Treasury, uh, Treasury Building is appealing to the loyal women of America. He's now saying, yes, we are appreciative of all the women who are now working at as Treasury girls. We can pay them less, we can do a better job, but we need more support than, <clears throat> than women working as clerks. His approach was to call loyal women to action and create the new sinews of war. I would like to ref refresh everybody on the point that at this point in time, there are no cell phones. There's no interstate highway. There's no ability to easily contact, no computers, no internet. So all the activities that are being done are being done hand to hand, face to face. Um, many of the women who got together for these jobs at the home front were originally parts of church groups or sewing groups, but they got together and provided for the soldiers. Originally, it was part of the Sanitary Commission services. They sent volunteers out to the, home, out to the, um, the units in the field who were caring for soldiers in the field. But to care for the soldiers, they also needed food, they needed blankets, they needed shirts, they needed socks. And um, the women at the home front were asked to be sending these, to be knitting, to be um, doing anything they possibly could. And there are stories of women in their buckboards running around and raiding various houses to get blankets that they could send on to the troops. But one of the most important things that women did was started organizing sanitary fairs. 
And the sanitary fair concept is almost akin to something that <clears throat> we would think of today as like a state fair, where it is lasting for a week or two weeks. And it is a major event that thousands of people are coming to, dignitaries are coming, they're raising money. And some of the outcomes of these are beautiful souvenirs. Women are uh, the great central fair uh, that you see as the token in the center here is from Philadelphia, 1864. Extremely rare, very collectible. Um, stamps were designed and sold. The ribbons were designed and sold. These were across the country and are still extremely collectible for people today. And these sanitary fairs were across the country. This was a way of bringing the country together, the women together to do something that had never been done before to create this central cause. And at that time, a dollar in 1860s money is worth today, was worth the equivalent of about $25 today. So this was no small matter that the women who were involved in, for instance, the Philadelphia Great Central Fair that I've highlighted here from 1864, raised over a million dollars. And this was um, money that was available now to the troops, in addition to the knitting and the blankets and the clothing that was sewn and sent on down to take care of the troops. Again, Cleveland, St. Louis, these were huge affairs, very well orchestrated and raised a tremendous amount of money that could not have been, um, that the United States at that time was kind of unable to be able to support the troops as well as they did without the um, women's help. And one other quick legacy here, shortly before Lincoln um, was assassinated, one of the last bills that he signed actually authorized the United States, what is now the Veterans Administration. And it was, it was totally clear to him that even though the war, that the war was being won now, there were casualties of war that were costing money, casualties of war that would be a legacy that was going to be very expensive. And the women who were in Milwaukee raised money from their soldiers' fair, which happened after the war had actually ended. And the money that they raised went to purchase land and to, per to begin building a building that became one of the first three um, veterans' hospitals in the United States. Now, people today and thereafter have always been collecting. There are wonderful collections that come from the ribbons and from the beautiful medallions that were crafted um, in commemoration of the organizations that are supporting the sons of the Union veterans, the women who were involved, Women's Relief Corps, badges, medallions. Again, memorabilia is extremely collectible. And if you look at the beauty of some of the ways that these are crafted, were crafted then, and are crafted today, it is a legacy of, of um, art. Both to appeal to you that Abraham Lincoln's legacy is related to money and money matters of the Civil War are important. They are, they are us, they are what we look at today. And, and if many people look at, at money as uh, we've had the issue in COVID in the last several years of no small change shortages, we have many people today who don't even use cash anymore. They're only using plastic cards. So it's important to start remembering or re-honor as we go through the next four to five years, as we are remembering the Civil War, the 160th anniversaries, that President Lincoln was a money president. So thank you for enjoying. I hope you enjoyed Abe Lincoln's legacy and how the Civil War changed our money and how money changed the war. Thank you very much. And I will go into some questions. Um, one question, was there any restriction or regulation on national currency? Because they were printed at several different places. And so how did they regulate that or did they regulate that? Uh, I, I can't speak very with much authority um, to that. Obviously there had been absolutely no federal regulation of banks before the Civil War. And there were a great number of bank failures, especially with experiments like free banking in Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, there were no specific requirements for uh, the COVID deposits on hand. 
um, like a Federal Reserve? Kind yeah, of, uh, Federal Reserve kind of deposit didn't exist. Uh, I would have to dig a little bit more deeply into how the law itself reads. Um, obviously, it's been amended several times since the Civil War, and uh, obviously, printed mature, printed national notes that uh, I've shown you uh, did not come out until about 1900, 1910. And that's 40 years worth of time. I, I cannot speak with authority what happened during that time to provide the kind of regulation that uh, listener is curious about. But I can tell you this state had, I mean, Hugh had written into the law the provision that kind of allowed it to be a rebirth, if you would, or at least a renaissance of state banks, state chartered banks as well. They did not go out, they were not phased out as it sort of looked like for the first few years. That's another area to look at, and that is the balance of power between those banks that became part of the national system and those that remain independent from state charter. Well, the other potential answer for this, and I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but where the, um, the paper money was printed was primarily in New York by the American Bank Notes Company. Until a point in time, and I cannot tell you what that point in time was, that that function, that infrastructure function was brought down to Washington, D.C. And thereafter, the notes, the printing was all done under the roof of the Treasury, if I remember correctly. About 1877. So it was, but the previously was not under the roof of the Treasury. Okay, Awesome. Um, and actually, you can go ahead and um, stop sharing your screen so that everyone can see a bigger picture of you guys instead of the screen. And I have, I think, a few more questions here. Um, so why was no coin ever struck at the Dow's Mint? I think I'm saying that correct. You see that it opened fully and then it never printed anything. Why is that? Uh, for several reasons. Number one, um, the whole transportation issue had, and safety of the money had changed. Number one, uh, Wells Fargo Company came into existence and began to provide the service of safer transportation of gold. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, the Dow's uh, became more of a, a center of activity when the Transcontinental Railroad came through in the early uh, years right after the Civil War. And it expedited the movement of gold out to Portland. Ships would take the gold down to San Francisco safely with the Wells Fargo protection. Uh, agents were on board the ships at that point. And I guess the, the bottom of the bottom line is it took them so long, it just doesn't sound like a long time to us. Authorized in 1864, funded, built by 1870, and by then it had already become obsolete because of. Wells oh, Fargo well, and everything else. And yeah, the, the gold, gold kind of ran out as well. Yeah, in that area, they tapered so. off a little bit. But yeah, the, it's, a, it's a fascinating story because the, the building itself remains to this day. Um, it, it, it spent years doing absolutely nothing, to be honest with you. It was state owned, it was an orphan. And uh, again, now with a new owner, uh, has a flourishing business called Free State Brewery. So that's got a whole new life but never did strike a single coin. You're absolutely right. Hmm. That's fascinating. <laughs> I'd, I'd never heard of that mint before. So that, <laughs> I thought that was a really cool thing to learn about. <laughs> right? Not yeah. many people have. No, not at but all. Abe Lincoln approved it. So there you go. Ties into Abe's legacy. Yeah. People are enjoying a good drink. Did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know we are a little bit over time, a little bit over our hour time slot, and I want to give people a little time in between presentations if they choose to go to the one that's starting at 2.30. So I will let you guys go. Thank you, everybody, for showing up and listening to the presentation. And thank you again, Rebecca and Rick, for the awesome presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. All righty. Bye now. Talk to you later. Bye, guys. <laughs>